Somewhat stunned that we're approaching July. Okay. Yeah. We're the unprepared. Summer as well. Oh my God. So we're going to get those screws. They march for five years. Plumbing, the electrical. Um, how are you? Good, how are you? So, the, so like the. Yeah, I can't do it. It's not actually hot. It's like. like I think like said this in college. I, I was going to say, where did you? Seven weeks, winter summer. I don't know what it is. Come out with that. She's going to New York. Excavator yeah. University. What? Cool. So, oh, you're trying to talk to them to stay in local, but um, that was before she knew she was accepted. Yeah, that's kind of bad. Since then, I lost all sorts all over time. Keep her to you. All the pipes and stuff. Wow. So, anyways, yeah. So, when I say plumbing, what's that? 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 You know, 25 like minutes in the subway, like, so they're, it's like that's pretty cool. Yeah. 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 And they're like long friends in the neighborhood. So I've yeah. permitted myself. I'm comforted yeah. by that. They don't need as much trouble usually together. I haven't explored much. I've never had all this picture. It is. It's always so much other stuff that has to go there. So, for that, I'm going to do it. Yeah. We spent time in the city and hotels, but they're very expensive hotels. Sadly. Well, I'm pretty sure that yeah, it is. Right. Right. Well, she literally has an arrow saying, I yeah. sound very excited about being only child in the right. years. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't think that's going to go well for him. He may not. <laughs> He's not quite as focused as my daughter was. Creek Alliance today is 300 CFS. Uh, 
125 year historic average is 466 CFS. So the peak flow at Lions during the runoff this year <coughs> occurred on June 13th, and the flow rate was 976 CFS. The 125 year historic peak um, is approximately 575 CFS. And right now, over the last couple weeks, it's been dropping pretty quickly. Calling St. Grand Creek is Highland Ditch. Added number 8004 with a priority date of November 30th, 1871. Calling the main stem of the South Platte impact in District 5, <coughs> Springdale Ditch. Calling that in number 13,349. Priority date July 19th, 1886. So Ralph Price Reservoir is approximately 980 feet from full, so it's getting pretty close. Um, it's anticipated probably the first or second week of July to be full. So. Um, and currently released at 175 CFS. So Union um, Reservoir is full and we're releasing 7 CFS. Local reservoir storage is approximately 86%, and CET system is approximately 93%. Any questions? Are there any questions of the school? Yeah. 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 When was the usually flow? When was the usually flow? About the first, second week of July. Okay, so we're kind of. We're right on average, yeah. Right on average. We're going cruising right along, so we should be uh, able to get some, uh, exchange some transfer fees into there. Get that shot back on. The only other thing that I know is in the CBT storage, they pump was at 40,000. Yeah, 40,000. Yes. So keep in mind in that <coughs> number, there's also a point of gap that they pump a lot of this cash just yeah. there as well. So. Yeah, the good thing is it pumped our order fully this year and enough for an order next year, like two years of supply. That's, that's good. <laughs> I mean, the good news is there's, there's actually space for the point of gap order. So that's how does that, good news. How does that accounting work? Do they? Then next year would they count? Would, would they pump for the next year if they were able to? Or like so, does it just keep rolling in that, nope. in that way? Yeah, the uh, the most of the municipal well, the municipal subdistrict water providers have basically given the direction to run to keep pump up to two years of uh, orders. Right now we're running around twenty thousand acre feet a year of windy gap orders. So we try to get in about forty to forty-five thousand. You got to pump forty-five thousand to get forty because there's an introduction shrink and then there's um, some water over to the west slope from the agreement. So that, um, that gives us a two years supply. You have to be a little careful because you're looking two years out, and, and this year the CBD system is really getting reasonably full. It's not not projected to spill this year. But um, we're pumping, um, and if it were to spill next year, it wouldn't spill till June or maybe July. So we'll be able to uh, utilize a big portion of that of next year's order in the winter time period. We have when we use our, our water. So um, we basically have this year's order already done, and then the water we'll use next winter when we get water is in storage right now. So that's good. Any other questions or comments? Great. Thank you, Nelson. Thanks. Uh, next item is item five. It's public and to be heard in special presentations. Are there any other? Nope. Okay. Um, item six, agenda revisions and submission of documents. I have one. I do. Item seven, development activity. Doesn't look like there's anything on that. Item eight, uh, general business, 8A is cash and lieu review, Wes? Yeah, so um, just got a brief memo in your packet, I'll hit the highlights of that. On March 8th, City Council approved resolution R2022-35, establishing the fee for cash and lieu, water rights received, the current $48,500 per acre foot. So I'm on page 21. Uh, so, council recommended that the Windy Gap project 
be used as a principal project that would represent that cash flow. Um, so to further break that down, 30,000 acre feet, $30,000 per acre foot for the original Windy Gap conversion to public project, and then $18,500 per acre foot for the city's current investment in the Windy Gap Burmy project. Um, the Colorado River Connectivity Channel project may see some additional cost increases due to the fuel costs, but that information won't really be known until probably the next quarter review. So at that, with that being said, um, there's no additional uh, information to suggest that the, uh, the project is uh, would warrant a change in cash flow at this time. Any questions or comments for Wells? Go ahead, Scott. Yeah, hey, Wes. Um, I was just curious. We, we talked last time, two times ago, but I was just curious about the um, reaction as to in the community uh, relative to the relatively steep increase in cash flow. Yeah. That's a good question. Um, so a lot of people that were in actively engaged in the development review process, we made a fairly extraordinary effort to let all those people know. And um, although they would have liked it to stay lower, they were prepared and they satisfied their nexus prior to the change. Um, the people that have been coming in since then, they've also heard that it was changing. They weren't yet ready to make that change, but they've been preparing accordingly. So some people have been acquiring their own non-historic water rights to uh, transfer and others are just um, uh, waiting to see when their project is closer towards the end of their uh, ready to move dirt. So um, it, it wasn't, haven't heard anybody that was like shocked that they weren't, it wasn't unexpected, but that doesn't mean that they Again, sure. Like no, to stay lower. I don't know if they had a dampening effect on economic activity, but frankly, it'd be hard to discern that between that and interest prices and <laughs> interest rates and supply chain yeah. prices. So right. I was just wondering what you heard on the street. Yeah. Thanks. Anything further? Go ahead. Yeah, I do. I have a couple questions. So, um, so the eighteen thousand five hundred that was a number that we. We've seen that kind of broken down in the past because that's the number that was kind of consistently used over over many years or many quarters at least. Um, the the thirty thousand per acre foot. So that that was something that we discussed kind of a couple times ago, I guess. Do we have like kind of like the calculus on that? Like so, in other words, is there a spreadsheet somewhere where that number was like derived at, or is that? I know that in the a couple of the paragraphs here. It describes the, the pieces that went into the calculus. So, but is there like a, a like a line item where the values essentially that get summed up that arrive at this thirty thousand that those things exist? I'll let you. Okay. So um, we have the numbers of, of where all those components when we built in the nineteen eighty five. But in 1985 dollars, that was like 6,500 acre foot, so that's much less than this. Um, the 30,000 came about. Um, the uh, Platte River Power Authority had 160 units of the project. They they only want um, a little over 100 units. So they, over the years, they've been selling. In the last year or two, they sold a number of units and. On the you know on on the fair market value um, based upon a uh, bids, and so the high bids were in the twenty eight to twenty nine thousand dollar range, and so they just recently, and I don't know not if you've heard I don't think they've closed yet they just recently put ten more units on the market, their minimum was thirty thousand. So the minimum bid is 30,000. We should know, we will know, I believe, we'll know by the September cash and move what the actual bid, what the actual bid amount, sealed bid for those units are. And we'll bring that information as soon as we have that. Um, but you can't, you know, you really can't get a better price than <laughs> sealed bids on the open market. It's not really quite open market because you have to 
be in the municipal subdistrict. Yeah. So you have a little bit more of a limited audience to sell it to. But on the other hand, um, there are enough people in it in the northern Colorado area that either are in the municipal subdistrict or could could petition into the municipal subdistrict. It's everybody from you know, about well kind of left hand U.S. Olympia clear to four columns, you know, this and all the all the messes. All the, it, I don't know. It wouldn't be easy for the rural domestics because you got to you got to get everybody in the sub district. But there, there are there are enough people that can get the sub district. Here. So that's it's basically the fair market value of that. So that, I guess that was going to be my comment was that when you so if we're looking at page twenty one, so there's a, a first kind of paragraph where it just kind of introduces some things. Second paragraph a little bit describes some stuff. The third paragraph is it kind of it's like a list of essentially the factors that go into this to, to this value, right? It's like water rights and infrastructure, et cetera, right? And it makes it seem like it's like a, a an inflation adjusted cost to do those things, to go out and get the water rights and to go out and build the infrastructure and et cetera, right? So it's almost like that sixty five hundred dollars an acre inflation adjusted to today, right? Plus maybe some differences in cost or something associated with what it, cement prices or something. Um, and then, and I guess it could be a little clearer, I suppose, that it's actually a market value, right? It's like, it's based on like real, um, what competition for this particular resource or something, rather than actually kind of a spreadsheet that actually puts a cost on every single one of the things in that third paragraph. And I think it kind of into a full paragraph. Yeah, it's always multi bits. I'll make that clear. Do you have anything? Is that all Yeah, awesome. Any further questions for me? Go ahead, Nelson. Um, so a little bit tangentially related to this, but what if it's the same historical taxation as NEPA was done? So, so NEPA was done and uh, received a finding of no significant impact. Um, my presumption is nobody will file against that, <laughs> uh, like they did the hair or the Jamiola uh, Reservoir, uh, because I don't know anybody that doesn't want it. Um, so the contract is moving forward. Um, unfortunately, the contractor that's doing the work didn't get fuel and they would get because they didn't know how long the fuel the process they didn't get a fuel contract. So it'll probably just kind of a forewarning in September you'll we'll, we'll hear um, there will be a fuel surcharge uh, most likely. Um, we feel it'll be around the million dollar range um, for uh, but other than that don't, I've not seen any real stumbling blocks in moving that project forward. I can maybe add a little to that. So there was a limited notice of proceed that was awarded at the last board meeting. Um, and it was limited because we're waiting for the uh, NRCS is one of the big funders and they needed to just get some final approvals before they could fully fund their portion of it. The concern was is if you didn't get going on a limited notice to proceed and start the work, you'd miss a whole season of work. So there is a little bit of you know kind of work prior to the NRCS approvals being done. That, so there will be work going um, immediately in terms of some of the prep work and to facilitate getting kind of the, the full scope of work getting going. So that that was the way it was from the last northern municipal subdistrict board meeting. Build this? Do they have to shut down any tax operations? No, no. Um, my understanding is they will not have to shut it down. And then, and can you correct me if I'm wrong? They've um, well, I mean, part of maybe timing too. I think as the river draws, you know, the the pumping season is going to be over, and then they can do quite a bit of work there. 
And then I think they have their timing such that they'll uh, continue to be able to, uh, I think that was kind of one of the conditions on being able to move forward uh, as they are. So I don't think there's any, um, I haven't heard anything that will impact the company in the The good thing about doing the limited um, start, it was because Windy Gap pumped pretty good, 40,000 acres, 40,000 acres this year. Um, but it shut off about a week or two ago, week and a half ago, uh, because it pumped enough. We actually could have had pumping this year, believe it or not. Um, but it shut off, and so now what had to happen was during the reservoir. But you can still pump even when the reservoir. If you got enough guts, I, <laughs> yeah, I, I applaud those operators. <laughs> if they're they're going to try to, you know, they're going to pump. But right now, there's no pumping going on, and there won't be any pumping until third, right next spring. So it's really important to be out there this summer, get that work done, because they, they did have to drop. They will have to drop the reservoir. Because the first thing you do is you take the dam on the yeah. south side and you know rip it up, put a brand new rebuilt down on the inside so you have very good equipment coming to each other. Um, it's my understanding they will not be able to fill the reservoir. That will be done, finished enough to fill the reservoir next year, but we'll be able to put some water, enough water into it, probably, I'm pretty sure, to be able to pump. Um, it's going to be, it's going to be real critical next spring. That's the critical Period. Y'all have already started. <laughs> this well in this summer. So is the goal to do excavation this year and then pump it hard in May? Well, yeah, I don't recall exactly the, the full scope of this year, but yeah, I think they wanted to get some of the initial clear and grub work done, kind of the prep work in advance. Of, once that RCS wants to do it's off the races. So um, yeah, I think they're going to get, as Ken was alluding to, try to get enough done this year so that by next spring they're able to run the water and at least pump whatever they're going to have to work with. But I mean, the good news is since they pumped in you know, essentially two years order this year, I think it'll also give us a couple of years. Okay. Okay. Um, Keep looking good, I'll put it that way. <laughs> project, you're always optimistic at the start of a project. <laughs> But no, but and once 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 that's done, I mean, once that foundation for the relocated dam is done, you, you really you're committed. I mean, so I would put it in the category of committed to get it done <laughs> this summer. Well, you know, working on it, not this summer. So we hope it goes well. Anything else? Um, item nine, which is items from staff. The first item. My name is when you get a project update again. Yeah, just a, a real quick update. Um, sort of a quick update on the project. I've got a, a picture. I don't know if everybody's, you know, these pictures are updated once a week on the uh, when you get a permit project uh, to me all the website. But this I thought was a pretty pretty good picture. Really, you can you're looking down the center line of the dam. You can see the pipes going down there. Um, that is now a good portion of that is constructed. The last I heard it was 70% done and then probably a little bit more by now. Um, the critical part of that was once you get that done, then we do some final grouting and they then have the foundation ready um, for the construction of the dam. You can really, really, really start to see the footprint of the dam now um, here. Um, and then the quarries over here. This is, they're staging the uh, hydraulic asphalt plant up here, uh, just above my water line. That, that was a kind of a unique project. It, it was a lot of the, some of the construction of that pad was paid for by Larimer County because that's going to be the parking area for the recreation area of Larimer County once the dam is done and up. So you kind of see that. And then you can see right over here, uh, the, the bridge over the um, uh, penstock uh, for the CBT system is already done. 
So this will be the road that will come in once the dam is done. And of course it goes on, you can see it going on around here. It goes clear to the backside of the reservoir. And so uh, that gives you, a, yeah, you can see a little bit more of the road. You can see the quarry, this will all be underwater, but the quarry is over here. Um, you can see in this picture the coffer dams right, right over here. Um, but uh, so far going well, they've just started actually a double um, crew sequence where they have two crews per day, two full crews per day. We got a lot of people up there. <laughs> got a lot of work going on. Um, and uh, it's, it's really going well. Um, and then we had talked about in the past about trying to get a um, tour set up. And unfortunately, everybody else wants a tour too. <laughs> and, and I had hoped to set one up for the July water board meeting, so or we go up right before the meeting and, and not make everybody come more than one day. Um, it's actually looked like turn to August. Uh, so I have three different options I wanted to talk with the board about. Um, the first is um, if you don't mind coming or taking two days in a month, um, the Monday before our next water board meeting on July 11th um, is open. We can set up a tour and just do a tour that day. Um, the July 8th, actually from July 18th to July 29th, every single day is booked up. Um, the second option is on our water board meeting date in August, August 15th. Um, the afternoon's already booked up, but the morning is available so we could do we do a tour of the reservoir site first, and we wanted to we wanted to do a quick tour of the conservation gardens up there, and talk a little bit about water conservation, and, and have lunch on the plaza there. So what we could do is it'd be a little bit earlier on well, it'd be a morning tour, lunch there, and then we'd come back here for the water board meeting. That way you'd only have to have one day. Um, and then the third uh, option is your water board meeting on September 19th. That whole day is open, so we could we could schedule one more mid mid part of the day to where it wouldn't take the whole day, and, and um, then be back here for uh, the water board meeting. So, um, got kind of wanted really to talk to the board and see what your preferences are. I, I appreciate how much work you put in, you know, <laughs> volunteering to come one you know once a month every month. So that's why I didn't want to set one up off days. Um, and generally, once you get to about mid August, you could also do any other day as well. You know, any of the four days of the week. There's two options when we do do it. Um, they call it the Overlook Tour. There's, there's well, where that picture was taken, that's Overlook in the Valley. Um, that tour from Northern's office up, you know, you. It's really the best single spot to stand. You can see the entire valley and the entire project. Um, that's about a two hour tour from Northern's office out there to look, see the project, the presentation there, and then back. Or they also have the valley tour uh, where you're actually going down in and driving into the construction site, which for skates, we like that. <laughs> engineer gates, we like that, but um, that's about a three hour tour. So it takes about an hour longer. We get because I think they go to the oversight and then they go down to the valley and, and take you through it. So it's a little bit longer, but you get a little bit closer to the view of everything. Uh, so kind of some different options there. I wanted to see what the board, what your preference are, if you have any preferences, um, and you know, we'll then start the board. Are you, are you saying? August and or September would probably be the best of best choices. Um, it, August is like July is kind of jammed up. You know. July is pretty jammed up on, if you want it on the same day as water board. So you don't have to come in twice. There is July 11th is available. It's a Monday, July 11th. It's right after 
the Fourth of July is probably why. <laughs> Monday after the Fourth of July week, um, but yeah, August and September are all out there. So I guess the question would be: Do you guys want to, if you want to do it, do it the same day as Waterboard A, and then B, do the two or the three hour tour, and then I don't know if there's feedback for Ken because if you wait, my guess is you're going to be talking October or November. Yeah. <laughs> so if you guys want to, is there any feedback for the? Guys, on what you want to, what sounds the best for you? I mean, I'll, I'll speak up, I guess. What, once the school year starts, um, of course, I have Monday afternoons for this meeting, but I, I generally don't have Monday mornings, so that September for me would be a little difficult. Uh, however, the, the the August sneaks in right before the school year starts for me, um, but I don't know you have, you have children or something else. No, I think August 15th is what's preferred for me. I can't do the July day anyhow, so. August Okay. And cool. then do you guys want to do the, is that availability for the three hour or the two hour? Um, either one hour? would be available, but it would require doing it in the morning, so it would take most of the day. Of the three hour show is more. <laughs> the 15th would also work for me. I prefer to do the longer one where you can actually see, especially if. Hydraulic asphalt. I don't know if they'll be laying it then, but they might. Yeah, they, I'll find that out too. Uh, they should be pretty close. Yeah, I, I prefer the longer one. Uh, okay, so we're all the way up there in my school. Yeah. I take a full yeah. tour. When you get an order of magnitude of equipment to go, which is yeah. when you're up top, it kind of all looks like ants, but when you're down there, you see the haul trucks and some of the holes. I think it's cool when you put all the pieces in place. Okay, well, I will set us up for August 15th. We'll do a morning tour, we end up back in Northern, and then we'll have lunch and tour the conservation gardens, and then we'll come back to the very top board. So, I appreciate uh, everybody doing that. And we'll, we can meet here because we have some 15 passenger buses. I look at yeah, the <laughs> we might still be. Sure. You can you can just reserve one of those real easy. <laughs> They're common beer maybe with that. <laughs> yeah, well they, they park them out here, so, so if I get in early in the morning. You get the keys, you know. I'll get keys and help. Anything further on that? That's all I've got. Thank you very much. That helps a lot. Okay, so 9B is the water resource engineering project update, Jason. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick update on our South St. Crane Pipeline pump station project. Uh, that one's kind of been hit with some delays and stuff from trying to procure materials and everything. Having said that, we're starting to get some materials in. Uh, we're not quite ready to make the connection into the north line yet. We're still missing a couple key pieces. Um, but they are starting to come in. Um, the pump station should be ready to ship July 11th, which um, it's, it's a few months behind schedule, but again, um, overall, it's not really delaying the project because even if we would have had the pump station on time, it just would have been sitting in the pit without any connections to it. So um, overall, um, things have kind of worked out in our favor, favor with some of these delays. And so anyway, um, I'll be flying out um, July 8th to go do one final inspection before it ships. Um, and then um, it should be here um, on the 14th or 15th and we'll instantly take it off the truck and place it down onto the concrete. So we only have the crane tied up for one day. Um, and so we're, we're still expected to um, bring the pump station online sometime in September, it could be um, early October, it just kind of depends on when we can shut down the north line. So we'll have to work with uh, uh, Canon West and the plant operators and stuff and O&M because when we shut down the north line for this project, we'd also like to go and make repairs up on the upper section and stuff, try to, try to hit everything all at once. And we'll also have um, button rock outlet shut down um, in September for um, making those gate repairs. So it's a little bit of coordination and stuff going on, but we're looking at probably you know late September, um, early October to have that pump station online. Um, but so far, minimal change orders and everything like that. So minus uh, you know some additional parts here and there. Very very little scope creep, and uh, other than the delays and stuff, you know from procuring materials and stuff, everything's been going great. No incidences. Um, the town 
actually is using our contractor as a role model for other contractors. Like, hey, this is how you should be doing it. This is what your your your, your site should look like. This is proper um, you know storage of materials and maintaining your site. So it's been going really good. So, um, but yeah, it's just uh, finally we've got a ship date and uh, an inspection date on the pump station. So we're excited. Ninety thousand pounds. They waited over the weekend. It's, a, it's the largest pump station they've ever done. And they don't fully under, they don't fully know how they're gonna get it out of the door. <laughs> but they're like Oops. they're like, that's our problem. We'll we'll figure it out, but they might end up having to take down seems like you would have asked that question before you <laughs> just <laughs> mentioned no, just that that thing that, that. yeah. yeah. They made it seem like this was like the perfect excuse for them to make some updates yeah. to the facility. <laughs> Their airflow. So Great. Anything else? That's really it. Any questions? Great. Great. Thanks, Jason. Absolutely. All right. So on the 9C um, water conservation update. Oh. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so we are planning a master plan update in the next coming years. And we wanted to start out with a little bit of plan history. So I'm going to give a little presentation about the history of our efficiency master plan um, and in further meetings we'll dive a little bit deeper. Um, so I just wanted to start out with going over conservation versus efficiency. We often use them uh, interchangeably, but they don't always mean the same thing. And so when we are talking about conservation, we're talking about a careful preservation and protection of something. Um, and then efficiency is doing the most with less. Um, and so when we think about conservation, it's an active behavior change. So zero scaping, policy updates, um, actively changing a mindset. Um, and efficiency, we often refer to as passive conservation. Um, so those are just fixture updates, fixing leaks, installing drip lines, um, doing things that we have been doing, but doing them more efficiently. So going into the history of our plan, um, House Bill 911154 um, was passed in 1991 and it declared that, well, it's called the Colorado Water Conservation Act. And um, it created the Water Conservation Office and declared that it's state policy to enhance water use efficiency with the objective of providing water for all beneficial uses in Colorado. Um, it also required that all local providers who supply more than 2,000 acre feet annually um, have to develop and adopt a water conservation plan um, and enact it by July of 1996. So we did that and we created our 1996 and at the time we called it our conservation plan. Um, and these are our guiding principles, basically prolonging the adequacy of our existing resources, being a demonstration of our commitment to responsible environmental and natural resource management, um, creating a public awareness campaign about the semi-arid climate that we live, and ensuring the efficient use of our water systems to ensure that we are meeting our population growth needs. These are the original conservation plan overarching efficiency goals, um, and we continue to, to use these in each of our plan updates. We don't have to read all of them, but just so you guys know, there are nine guiding goals that we continue to embed in all of our plan updates. Um, so in 2004, the Water Conservation Act um, kind of went through an update and led to the creation of the guiding document from the CWCD, which requires all of the cities to go and dive a little bit deeper. So this is how we developed our guiding principles of the water conservation program for our city. Um, and basically it's, it's um, requiring profiling of existing water supplies, um, water demands, historical demands, um, and most importantly, selecting water efficiency activities and programs for our city. And this um, led us to develop our overarching goal for our city's program, which is to reduce our raw water demand by approximately 10% by build out, um, which would be about 3,500 acre feet. Um, 
built out is assumed as um, 2048 or 125,000 population. Our current population is just under 100,000. Um, in 2013, we underwent a program evaluation. Um, so we hired a consultant agency to analyze the effectiveness of our water conservation programs. Basically, they recommended that we continue but do more and do bigger. So that's what we have continued to do. It's just our expanding our rebate programs um, and developing a more robust water waste ordinance. Which leads us to our most recent update in 2017. Um, we switched to a more programmatic and strategic goal layout for our plan. Um, so we developed these five overarching strategies, indoor and outdoor efficiency, metering and loss prevention, education and outreach, and ordinances and enforcement. Um, we offer, before 2020, the city offered toilet rebates um, internally. Um, and then we developed partnerships with Resource Central and Efficiency Works to do outdoor efficiency rebates. Um, and then we continued our metering and water loss prevention through our AMR um, introduction of AMR. We're still doing that. Um, and then continuing education and outreach and ordinance and enforcement. A little bit of what we've accomplished. So I mentioned our partnerships, and those are really our bread and butter of our water conservation program. Our partnership with Efficiency Works, um, we grew in 2020 so that we don't, the city doesn't offer direct rebates. Um, we go through Efficiency Works now for all indoor water efficiency for residential, commercial, and multifamily. Um, and then we also do outdoor water efficiency rebates for smart controllers or um, irrigation updates through them. Um, Resource Central is our biggest partnership. We do irrigation audits, um, garden in a box, and a lot of training and workshops with them. And then this year was our first year participating in their turf replacement program, which was wildly successful. Um, we, we set aside a small budget kind of as a test to see if people would be very interested and we sold out very rapidly without even doing any advertising. So we were able to fund 10 projects this year um, with 35 applicants. So we'll, we know that it's gonna be really successful in years to come. Basically, it's just um, a rebate program through Efficiency Works that the city sponsors so that they can get a discounted, um, their project to be discounted through Resource Central where Resource Central will come and remove their turf um, at a discounted rate. And then if those folks have leftover money, it's almost like a scholarship, they have leftover money, they can get garden in the boxes or other types of rebates. Um, we're continuing our outreach. Um, we've done advertising. We do a lot of our advertising and outreach through our city newsletters and through um, the inserts that go in, in our utility bills. We've in the past participated in children's water fair um, and that has has not taken place recently, but we're looking at hopefully bringing that back. Um, several conversion to raw water irrigation projects. I mentioned our automated meter reading project that is um, still underway and we're growing that to begin notifying customers of potential leaks very soon, hopefully. Um, and then we did a couple, Francie was amazing, um, and did a couple of turf replacement on a couple of city properties. And one of ours is our yard here. Um, and so we replaced uh, bluegrass with a native wheat blend. Um, and then last but not least, we participated in the Growing Water Smart Workshop, um, which basically integrates um, water resources and planning and allows us to work together to develop guidelines to grow our city with water land, water land nexus mindset. Yeah. Um, so I got to go on the garden tour a long one, two weekends ago. Nice. And a few weekends ago, I, remember. I went to the Lions Mall, so it's pretty cool. Boulder sold out, we couldn't even get a ticket to go to Boulder. But um, it seemed like it was a good opportunity to have some city presence on that tour as a fundraiser for the symphony. So we get that that's their own thing, they've done it forever and ever, but almost all the gardens that you went to had an emphasis on 
know, water reduction. Yeah. And it seemed like a really good opportunity in the future potentially to reach out and do something with something with acidic mine. And is that frankly it's popular. There are yes. tons of people calling for gardens in my mind. Yeah. In the summertime looking at what other people do in their garden. Mm -hmm. So just a thought for what it's worth up to three maybe. Yeah, that's for great. 2023. We we're revamping our uh, native garden at the rec center and we're working on one at Rogers Grove and at Sandstone Ranch. So Hopefully, soon we'll have like right. some yeah. more visibility. Yeah. Just a quick question on turf replacement. Cities turf replacement versus you know the general public. It's, it's the same principle. So um, are, are there different? Yeah. I, my thought was, are, are we encouraging reducing turf in general? Yes, Is that a little bit of both. Or a replacement, or I don't know. Yeah, a little of both. So the projects that we did, we replaced bluegrass with a different type of turf grass. Um, and so our our yard here, you can't tell, but it's not bluegrass, but it is. It cut our water and um, facilities bill in half. So we're using fifty percent less water here on our grass that you wouldn't even know. Um, so I feel like for moving forward, the city projects, we're, we're gonna gauge um, whether we'll do turf replacements or turf, like getting away from turf. Most of the residential pro projects are complete zero state. Um, and so that's a big part of why we use Resource Central so that they can get access to those zero plants that Resource Central provides guides to um, through Garden the Box. But most, Folks who are doing their own yards are definitely ripping out turf completely. Um, there's a couple of HOAs that we've worked with that have done like wheatgrass blend replacements um, on turf that's not being used by like kiddos and stuff like that. Uh, sorry. Um, you go ahead. Okay. Um, my question was going to be in regards to the HOA stuff because it's not necessarily property it's not city property but driving around Longmont you know I noticed these huge margins full of bluegrass mm -hmm. but yeah and I don't know is that an HOA decision or if so is can you guys have those HOA meetings yeah Lovely. yes I try to attend as many HOA meetings as they'll let me come we go to the neighborhood for breeders association which is like registered HOAs um, and then they can participate in city grants that the, the city will provide grants and Northern Water as well um, for them to upgrade. So we work closely with a lot of HOAs through our Neighborhood Fruit Breeders Association. Um, yeah, I think that's one of the things that Ken and I are really excited about moving forward is the opportunity to do a ton of turf replacements and, and letting it be known that you don't have to not have grass, that you can cut your water in half or maybe even less um, I was working with the folks at Northern Water and they're like, there's more that we can cut back on here on our yard where it would still be a healthy yard. But like, we're not outside playing kickball on it and stuff like that, like it's just grass. Um, so there is a big opportunity that we're really excited about. I hope that answered your question. It's like yes. a non-answer. Oh, um, well, I just, I would love to learn more and get my HOA involved. So. Yeah, absolutely. So I've got a question on your growing water smart. Um, so if you've been, you know, it's kind of in my mind, it'd be the planning department working, you know, how do you have new land use code that maybe a little bit more attuned to the water use? I mean, has that been working well? And I just look at like the strips, little strips of grass that is impossible to irrigate. And I mean, I'm just wondering, have you seen kind of, there have been code changes within Longmont or that sort of thing that have allowed kind of move away from that um, so that we're not, you know, 10 years from now having the same conversation right. about you need to get rid of those areas right. or deal with them. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. When so the city attended Glen Water Smart in 2020, um, and since then we've had a lot of staff turnover. Um, so we've actually applied to attend this year's workshop again. Um, because of that, I think, well, and 2020 was also virtual, and so this year we'll hopefully be in person and just kind of building those relationships. I think it really got the ball rolling, but I think there's a lot of 
room to grow in that area. And like I mentioned, we're really excited about arterial roadways, right of ways, like city owned properties that we don't manage transitioning to zero state. Um, that's something that's really important to me. So um, I think there's definitely room to grow. And we, we know how it goes with staff turnover and that, you know, somebody leaves and the ball gets dropped and then we have no idea that the ball's been dropped until like seven months later. <laughs> so we're really hoping that we get accepted into the program again this year um, and that we can get some folks who are planning to be at the city for a long time so that we can get like a really solid lease laid down so that we can do those code upgrades and we can do our design standard upgrades, which is one of the things that we started working on in 2020. Um, and there has not been any progress on that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or you can keep going if you want? You I was just adding there's a tremendous hunger to tear off turf. And the challenge is that there's not a lot of funds for it. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at the cost of watering turf that nobody wants versus the cost of digging out and putting in zero, you know, products and so forth, there's got to be some balance. And I, I think the city might want to be a little more uh, leader in that. I, I know that that um, small turf replacement project is very minimal in scope and scale, but. That seems to be where the biggest sweet spot is with reducing future water use. Yeah, absolutely. there's a lot. We, we did a project in Old Town, and we did people come by every day to talk to us. It's crazy how many people are really enthusiastic about, yes. about that. But there's some barriers for sure, and the costs are fairly extraordinary. Right. So. And really, you guys are nailing up on the head where we're planning to go. We really want this next update to be. Um, have more aggressive goals, have more accountability and kind of holding ourselves as a city to a higher standard of like, we need to get this grass removed, like we need to be models, which has been embedded in our plan since 1996 and being a model for the rest of the city. And so that's gonna be the direction that we hope to go. Um, in terms of addressing the goals, one model that I've heard about is a separate for indoor use versus outdoor use, and I don't know how feasible that is to retrofit, but it's certainly going to help with the long run, pushing people in the right direction. Yeah, that is a big barrier that we face, especially when working on these AMR projects right now and figuring out who actually has a leak, um, and that is a huge barrier, is that these multifamily units or the commercial units have just like a group meter or a master meter. So we have no idea how much really water is going on their grass or, or their outdoor areas. And, and also to build upon that, to be able to distinguish between the two, being able to identify as turf minimal from a market-based perspective, mm -hmm. double price. And you can people make it economic. I actually think it's the, the constant news cycle of what we've heard about situations in Colorado and all that. I think people, it's really in people's mind now. Yeah. There is more intentionality with regards to decreasing the market water use than I've ever seen in 25 years of living in Boulder County. It's pretty, it's pretty impressive. Now it's how we make it more accessible for people that don't have the means to, to do that. Landscaping companies are making it. <laughs> Good for them. I'm not saying that they shouldn't, but they're. Those guys are nine to 12 months out of any project because there's that, there's that much demand. Mm -hmm. Lots of people are looking for the funding, so the people right. can't, you know, they tear it out on their own. Thank you. Yeah. So exciting. Thank you all. My last slide is just mentioning if you guys can keep this on your back on your back burner, if you drive somewhere and see something exciting, like let us know. Um, because we're going to be coming back in the next couple of months asking for feedback, giving you our ideas and asking for feedback and reviews. So thank you for your comments today. Um, and that is exactly where we're planning to go. So. Great. Well, thank you. Any other questions or comments? For the team? Thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah, thank you. All right. So oh, and I have these handouts. They're just um, little one-pagers of what 
our current plan is. That way you don't have to read the whole thing. Yes. Okay, so we're on to item 10, which is items from the board. We have a list of the major um, project projects um, and items definitely scheduled for future board meetings. Any questions, comments on that list? I'm not seeing any. Okay. Item 11 is informational items and water board correspondence. All it was in the packet was the water board applications and the uh, drought management plan and the five year lease with East Cherry Creek Valley Water District. Okay. Anything, any other comments on that? Okay. No. Okay. All right, um, so we're under 12 items tentatively scheduled for future board meetings, so Cash Malou that will be revisited in September. <coughs> And as Ken mentioned, you'll have, I guess, hopefully the new market value the mini gap units. And then uh, B is discuss the future um, water board agendas. Anything anybody wants to discuss with that stuff? It's quite premature, but given the direction or the directive for the Western states to figure out how to reduce a whole bunch of water use relatively quickly, or what the federal government did. I'm just curious what the trickle down would be at the city level. I mean, obviously, there's regional elements, there's state elements, and then there's you go down the line. So, and I don't think we're ready to have that, but maybe that's a future board conversation, a real topic. We can work with them on that one, make more clear as to what they come out of that. Right. It's yeah. pretty draconian. Mm -hmm. um, it is? Yeah. We'll bring, we bring some information about that. I don't, I don't think there is much yet, but. <laughs> what is this? Yeah. And uh, September, October, November, there should be conversations that are interesting. Okay. I have kind of an unrelated question. Uh, water treatment plant in the Lions, is there a budget issue with moving forward with what we're planning to do, or, or what is it? I mean, um, sounds like there's a crossover on situation. There, there is concern if we were to bid it out today, we would have a significant cost um, in excess of what was projected. Um, we, we received a, an updated, um, most probable cost estimate from the engineering firm for the construction of the plant, which is well in excess of been looking at over the last three to four years. As a result, the city decided to not get out the project right away. Uh, wait and see what the construction climate looks like three to six months from now. Is there any downside to pushing it out? Cost of yours. <laughs> 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 but, but operationally, so I mean, uh, is that a big issue? It's not a real big issue because we have the Wayne Gattis water treatment plant on standby. We haven't used it for five or eight years. Is it, is it doable? It could be used if needed. Oh, yeah, it would, it would take some effort to get it up and running, but it's, it's a viable plant. Yeah. Um, so we would get it up and running. We've also done a couple interconnects with local water, other water providers. So, um, in an emergency, we would have some excess capacity. But mostly, we just we would have to crank up the gas, okay. which we hope not. To. Yeah. It depends on option. Yeah. Okay. Right. And we haven't seen in the last three or four or five years. We really haven't had any increase in peak production. How much more? I, I know I should know this number, but how much more capacity do we have at the existing plant? Like, we we could ramp that up another 10, 15, 20 percent or something. So. Uh, yeah, we were. It was originally rated. It was built and rated at 30 MGD, 
And that's about what we're maxing out right now. Um, it, I can't remember the exact number, it was either 10 or 15 MGD. It was re rated. Um, we put some more lavender plates in this flock chamber, a few other little things, and re rated it and got it up you know, around 40 or 45. So, um, you know, so we, we do have some excess capacity there. And then the way the added supply is 15 MGD. So we could have a pretty significant. So we have existing treatment capacity. Any other questions for me? All right. If that's it, I think we are done with the meeting. So I'll go ahead and return to the record. record time. <laughs> <laughs> it's missed uh, 21 minutes. <laughs> 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 We're going to try to be.